I got something I want to share with you guys. Um, I've talked about it before, but um, <clears throat> something I found um, because of something that I found, and I didn't know that I was going to find it because I wasn't looking for it, but then there it was right there. And it's, there's this thing called the law of first mention in the Bible. I don't know if you guys have ever done that before. It's kind of a fun little thing to do um, because it will inspire deep study if you're so inclined to do that. And basically what it is, it's way easier to do with Google. And you Google like um, anything like baptism, um, first mention of baptism in the Bible, and then it will take you to the first place. But um, <clears throat> you have to do a little bit of research because there's different translations. So um, kind of go through different translations and you'll find first mentions and then read it and study whatever it is. And then when you find it further down the road, like if you find something in the Old Testament, you find it in the New Testament, there's usually a really cool correlation. And that first mention will generally explain a lot more about the second mention or the third mention and on and on and on. Well, as it turns out, I was digging, and, and just so you know, when, when I'm doing studies, um, <clears throat> I will look at, at multiple translations of the Bible. I don't know if you guys do that or not, but it's another good kind of practice to be in because um, some of them are, are okay, but if you, if you do studies in different translations, you can go back and look at like the original Greek <clears throat> manuscripts or the original Hebrew manuscripts, and you can find words that may have been translated different in English so that us dull Americans can understand a passage better. Um, I guess assuming that we're not going to study all that deeply. But nonetheless, I found one here. And it just so happens that it's the end, at the end of chapter 5, which is not the end of the prophecy and judgments, but it's the end of this section of prophecy and judgment. And then we're going to move into chapter 6 where we kind of get into the cool um, Hineni, uh, where we got our Hineni verse from and all that stuff. But the opening is this. What's dad's version of connect the dots? Prophecy fulfilled. And what I mean by that is as, we, as, we've, been, as we've been going through the book of Isaiah, there's a lot of dots that are connected throughout the New Testament and other places in the Bible. And it's really cool when you can... Put those all together, and, and a quick way to do that, or at least get started, some of you might have the little references in your Bible. Um, at the end of a verse, it'll say like Chronicles 66 or something like that, 665. Um, and I'd encourage you to go to that too and see what the heck that verse is all about and how it applies to this. And once you get kind of rolling in this uh, law of first mention and cross-referencing and things like that, the Word of God can take on a huge huge new meaning, especially in passages that have kind of been um, just kind of glossed over. You know, we get, and that happens a lot where um, you're reading through, doing a Bible study or something like that, maybe a, a multiple verse thing or something like that, and the, the verses just kind of get, get flown right over it. When you break it down into a verse by verse like we're doing on Tuesdays, you can really get the whole oomph out of it. Oomph is an old Hebrew word. Yeah, and uh, it means like wow, maybe, or yeah, something like that. Look it up, Google it. Anyway, so tonight you're going to see a, a first mention, but it's not translated that way, strangely enough, in the New King James or the, the King James. But in just about every other translation, American Standard, Contemporary, NIV, uh, Amplified, Message, it'll all have that first mention. But as we get into it, I'll explain a little bit more. So I'm going to start off here in uh, something. Um, let's go ahead and start in Isaiah 5, 24, and we'll wrap up chapter 5 tonight, and then we're going to kind of bounce over into Acts for something really cool. So it goes like this. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their roots will be as rottenness and the blossom and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, 
The anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them. And the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuge in the midst of the streets. For all his, this anger is not turned, for all of this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar and will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt on their loins be loose, nor the strap of their sandals broken, whose arrows are sharp, with all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaming, their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely, and no one will deliver. In that day they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and if one looks to the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkness darkened by the clouds. Heavy, huh? Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord, and we thank you for all the cool stuff that we're going to see tonight, Lord, and a little bit of Bible mapping tonight, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us and help us journey through this and open our eyes and ears and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen? Okay, so... To get kind of kicking off on this uh, law of first mention, when I, when I read through this in the NIV, verse 24 said, Therefore, as tongues of fire devours the stubble. And you can see that in New King James it says, The fire devours the stubble. So, when I read that in the, in the New King James, I went and looked it up in a few other different um, versions or translations, and lo and behold, they all said tongues of fire. I thought, hey, that sounds really familiar. And where does it sound familiar at? There you go. So I booked it over to Acts, and I checked that one out. And we're going to look at it, because once I started putting the two together, and here's the really interesting thing about it. They ran very similar to each other, but uh, it was like a positive-negative thing um, from one side to the other, good and bad. But in the, the, tra the actual Hebrew and the actual Greek, the word fire... In, in Acts is a word called glossa. It's a Greek word, glossa. And it literally means tongue or like, like tongue in, in terms of speech, like uh, language. And in, in Isaiah's, it's actually a word called fotia, which means fire. That's what it means. And so they don't really mean the same thing. And I was kind of, you know, like maybe this is a sidebar. But as I started going through this thing, I saw something really cool. And so I thought tonight what I'll do is share it with you guys. Amen? And see if you guys get the same thing. Now, you're not going to find any of this, this stuff like in commentaries or stuff like that because I couldn't anywhere that I looked. And so theologically, it may not be like super sound, but cool, definitely cool. So, and being the, you know... The Roadhouse is the coolest church in the in Inland Empire. <laughs> Might as well just uh, go with cool. What do you say? So we'll let's take this first section here, and it says, Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble, the flame consumes the chaff, and the root will be rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust, because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So with that little section right there, what's happening is we're, we're certainly talking about judgment the judgment day if you will we've kind of gone through tribulation a couple chapters ago and the things that were leading up to tribulation and now as he's kind of wrapping up this section and remember like i said going into this thing isaiah has a tendency to jump around a little bit so we're gonna see this right now but it's not the end of it and in fact at the very end of this thing you'll see another kind of something that alludes to that final judgment of fire. But fire seems to be the catchword of the night. But anyway, so when I did the, the law of first mention on tongues of fire, popped up Acts 2, 3, I think it was, maybe. And yeah, it was there. But then I went ahead and Googled law of first mention Old Testament, and you know what it popped up? Isaiah 5, 24. And I thought that was really super interesting. Why didn't it call that one the law of first mention? Well, because like I shared with you, the words are not the same. 
And the law of first mention only applies to exact words, not necessarily phrases. So it would have had to say glossa back here in Isaiah as it did in Acts. But with that said, check out the cool correlation. So based on what I just shared with you there, that this fire is coming down, this, these tongues of fire are going to devour all these people. The stubble and the chaff are references to the people. And not only reference the people, but the, the waste of them. The waste in that they rejected God. And they turned to their idols. And in God's eyes at that point, they had, it was hopeless for them. They'd had their opportunity. And of course... Remember, this stuff is like a three-part series right here. This, what we're talking about right now, would actually happen to these people by way of um, Assyrians and Babylonians for the northern and southern kingdoms. But this also applies to us and or, you know, the future generations as we come upon uh, tribulation and the millennial kingdom, the millennial, um, the judgment, all that. So this is all still applicable for us i mean as, as you know the tribulation can happen any minute now i mean well the rapture could happen any minute now and so anybody from this moment forward it's 8 35 right now from this moment forward any of this can still take place even though it already did take place 700 years before christ so when when we talk about god's word being alive and active it is very alive and active. So now we're looking at this group of people that rejected God. And because they rejected God, he smoked them all. Gone. Well, now look at the opposite side of the spectrum with me over here in Acts 2, where we find this phrase used again. But it's going to be in a completely different direction. We'll start off in Acts 2, 3. Now we already know that you know they were in a room they were all in the same car, an accord, all this. Yeah. And well, God's word is very direct and to the point. If it was a Camry, he would have said they were all in one Camry. Okay. Anyway, there's big rush of wind and all that stuff was going on. Just like, just like in Isaiah, there was this big thunderous noise and all the stuff that we'll see here. But look what it says here in three. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. One sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So going back to that Greek word of glossa, knowing that it's a word that means tongue, language, speech, the, the tongues of fire makes a little more sense here because they're going to start speaking all these languages, all right? Then the languages they speak are going to be super important here in just a second. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense at the moment, but what's happening here in a nutshell is that in Isaiah, back here in Isaiah 24, this fire that devoured the stumble was the end of Judaism. And, and what I mean, organized Judaism, because from this point on, they would be, first the Assyrians would come and grab them, and then the Babylonians come and grab the other group of people. And then from then it would be um, Persia, and then Greece, and then ultimately Rome, all the way up to 70 AD when that whole siege of Jerusalem took place. And then the dispersion and the Jews scattered all over the place until the 1940s when they came back. But they're still not back yet. They still haven't set up the temple. So they're still not, even though... Judaism is alive and well. It's still not practiced as it was prior to all these events taking place that would eventually come and take place. They're not, there's not a sacrifice. There's not a priesthood. All that it was is still null and void. So go back with me to Isaiah for a second here as we're kind of bouncing back and forth. Now we all, I think, I think we for the most part understand that this is, this is judgment as we've kind of gone through a, like a real quick version of uh, prophecy in these first five chapters of Isaiah. And again, as we move through the 65 chapters of Isaiah, these things will all be broken down, but also Isaiah will introduce the Lamb of God as we're kind of moving through the book of Isaiah. So in verse 25, it says, Therefore, 
The anger of the Lord is aroused against people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them. And the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuge in the midst of the streets. Now, here's a really interesting verse. Now, obviously, we kind of get what was going on there. He finally got tired of it. He was done with it all. He gave him chance after chance after chance. In this case, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And generally, they didn't like what the prophet had to say. So what did they do to the prophet? Yeah. Off with his head or, you know, however they chose to take him out. Had they listened to him, the things that came about may have been different. Now, keep in mind that there were people that still loved God and worshipped God, but they were completely stifled. Their culture, as they had known it from Joshua and coming across the Jordan and all that stuff, systematically was canceled by pagan worship and idol worship and heathen worship and things like this. And so one thing after another was kind of taken away and taken away, and they didn't speak up about it, or if they did, it didn't go very well for them. And one by one, before they knew it, they couldn't even watch Pepe Le Pew on cartoons anymore because it was frowned upon. Yosemite Sam, out the door, right? And little by little whether it be by fear or whether it be by complacency, their way of life was removed from them to the point that they no longer even worshipped God as God anymore. God, in fact, wasn't worshipped at all. He was completely abandoned. And, you know, God's funny about being abandoned, man. He, he gets through, like, some serious feelings about it. And this is it right here. But look what it says here at the end of 25. I don't know why these people didn't pick up on any of this stuff. Maybe, maybe if you're just that blinded by your, I don't know what it is, your arrogance. and I don't know. It says, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, some of the, the more flowery commentaries were like, yeah, you know, so God's anger went against, you know, and all this bad stuff went on like that, yet his hand was still stretched out for them in forgiveness. But, in actuality, the, the Hebrew words for this aren't flowery at all. And, and the best analogy is when, like as a parent, some of you, you know, might be parents in here. And, like, you let your kid have a fresh one, you know, boom. And then, generally, you cock for the next one, right? At least my mom did. I don't know. She was like a repeating rifle, my mom. That's what this was about. It was about, boom, you just got one, and the hand is still stretched out. Because it said just before that, I don't know where they get the flowery part of it. For all this, his anger is not turned away. That doesn't sound like a real flowery handout. Like, okay, you know, now I'm all... I'm all better. I got to slap you guys around a little bit. And now I'm here to help you back. Look, man, God provided every way for them to come back. He, he bent over backwards for them to come back. Remember all the way back in Isaiah 1, he even said, look, come let us reason together. God even said, look, I'll talk to you guys about this stuff. This is God Almighty. He's not obliged to talk to anybody about anything. This is his law. You follow it or you pay the consequences, right? Yet he was still willing. He's going, yeah, you guys suck. Your sins are like blood, man. They're like crimson, but they can be white as gold, white as wool, if you're willing to come and talk. Nobody wanted to talk. All they wanted to do was come up with their goofy little sacrifices and all their little parties and stuff that they would throw and their new, new moons and things like that. And it was all fake. None of it was real. None of it was legitimate. And the only people they were fooling was who? That's right. They were only fooling themselves. They weren't fooling any. They certainly weren't fooling God. And he gave them chance after chance after chance after chance. And now we've reached the point where his anger isn't turned away and he's ready to let him have another one. But keep this in mind. He is a just and loving God. And he would have listened. If they had chosen to turn away from all their junk, put away all their idols, cop to being a bunch of boneheads and this and that, and that cock tan probably would have come forward in love and forgiveness. But that ain't what happened because 
In verse 25, it says, He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar. And you know what that means right there? There's a little person walking around in our parking lot. Oh, there's a little person with a parent. Yay. Okay. Um, he's going to be calling. And, and this is where, you know, people will, you know, God won't let anything bad happen to you. Just read Job if you believe that goofy line. Right? He's talking about, he's not talking about the banner of Judah. And he's certainly not talking about the banner of Israel. He's talking about lifting up the banner, which means, okay, so to, to understand this, uh, a banner, or I can't remember what the heck they call it now, but in the military, you know, they have their flag and they would, you know, nobody wanted to be the flag guy because he was like the first guy to die. And there was a good reason to kill the guy with the flag because everybody would follow the flag. Wherever the battle was going, the guy with the flag would kind of, lead the way, you know, following orders and whatnot. And so all the guys that could shoot really good are the candidates try to blow the guy with the flag up. And it causes confusion and disarray. That's why they would do that. So troops would scatter, lines would break and stuff like that. Later on, as history went on, the guy with the antenna sticking up off his back was the dude everybody wanted to shoot because he was the what? The radio guy that could call in reinforcements and artillery and stuff like that so god's talking about now lifting up a banner and if you watch any of the old movies you know braveheart any of those old cool medieval looking battle things they all had their banners their battle banners and that was who that army was and now god's saying he's going to lift up the banner from somebody else and who why is he why is he even talking about a banner a battle flag because he's about to unleash hell on these people that just absolutely would not pull their heads out of their hats, man. And sometimes the only way to get someone's attention is to what? Just cock back and give them a fresh one, right? <laughs> Pow! And then kind of get their attention, right? Well, in this situation, um, this is like, you know, in the words of Jim Morrison, this is the end, beautiful friend. It's not going to go good. And, and in this case, the banner, the first banner that would be God would be calling from afar off was Assyria. And it's really weird when you look at the maps of ancient, like ancient Assyria or Babylon, stuff like that. And you can see where all these, you know, and, the, and these in Asia, when you, when you say Assyria or when you say Babylonian, you're actually saying a lot of nations because the way things went was they would go over to this side from this side and beat up all the army people and then they would take you people and periodically they would transfer you to another place and you would be you know become slaves and stuff like that other times they would just send you right back home after the war was over but now you're flying under the assyrian flag and all the stuff you make whatever monies and grains and things like that products these people now own it and they're going to take it they, they can do whatever they want with you they sell you kill you, whatever it was. And so now, even though you are maybe, uh, you're like the northern kingdom of Roadhouse over here, and this is the southern kingdom over here, well, you now will be known as the northern kingdom as well because they own you based on battle. So when you're looking at these maps and these names that I'm going to share with you here in a minute, it's really freakish to see how it all changed. And, and not only how it all changed, but even though God allowed this stuff to happen for Assyrians and Babylonians and Persians to take these Jews, you're going to see where 700 years down the road, God's plan was laid out. Just nobody probably really saw it. So look what happens here. He's going to lift up this banner from nations afar and will whistle to them from the ends of the earth. Hey, you, go get them. They're all yours. Let them have it. And look, look what it says here. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. Look at the description of this army that's going to come against these. Here. Now the Assyrians were one bad, brutal group of people. And they had all kinds of really clever ways of not just killing people, which they did in, in ways like, uh, for instance, they would, they would like take a, a city or whatever, and they'd get like the mayor 
Bluesville, for instance. It's probably a good time to not be the mayor. And they would start at the hips and skin him and then hang his skin up on a wall for people that come in, you know, they might think they're going to come to the rescue of these people and they would see Cookie Man's skin all nailed to a wall up there. And it was really a psychological detriment to him, man. It was like, well, man, I don't want my skin put up there. Or they would pile heads up of the people in a pyramid and they would parade them around with these massive, big metal, like, giant hooks and they'd, they'd stick them through their jaw under their chin and out their mouth and then they'd hook them to the person in front of them and so they'd start dragging them along and you'd be like pulled by this hook under your chin and paraded around and I got to tell you man it was very effective because it was psychological warfare man you know it was bad enough to get you know killed in battle and stuff like that but then to be brutalized like that and they did a lot of other unspeakable things that I've I've learned that I, I won't share with you guys here. You can go do your own studies on the Assyrians and the Babylonians too. They were a brutal people and psychological warfare was one of their best weapons that they had because war was expensive for one thing and it was easier for a people to give up and just subjugate their nation to whoever these people were than it would be to like go fight. And they thought that was going to happen at Thermopylae, but it didn't. As you all know the story with the 300 Spartans with their spray-painted on abs and stuff. <laughs> what a fight that was. And I don't know if they actually did that then, but it was pretty effective in the movie. I mean, from what I understand, if you're into that thing, sort of thing. <laughs> did anybody appreciate the sprayed on abs? Anybody? Just one, two. Other. <laughs> Vicky's like, oh. like a little reaction there, like a little spring-loaded arm. <laughs> nice save. Anyway, look at this army. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt on their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals broken. And and I don't know if you guys caught this stuff. But this is all like a shot at Israel and all that they've been doing. They were lazy. They didn't want to do anything. All they wanted to do was party and then sleep all day long, party all night long. Their belts around their loins were anything but tight because they were doing all kinds of freaky stuff up on those. Remember those gardens up there on the hills and all the weirdo pagan, you know, anybody ever dance around fires naked? in the 60s or 70s where's mom look at mom's like don't don't even look at me right now okay that's cool there's some things you just don't share in church all right he's going look they're not going to be sluggards they're not going to be like you know pigging down on all, all kinds of junk and just feeling all sluggish and drunk and stuff like that. They're not going to be weary. They're not going to stumble around. They're not going to be sleepy and sleep. Their belt, their, their loins, that belt's going to be tight. They're ready for war. And that's what it means, man, when they cinch up that belt on their loins so their little, little dress doesn't fall down between their legs and stuff like that. And they trip, man. This is all about being prepared. And the straps on their sandals, they make sure they have good leather, man. They're going into battle. They, they make sure everything is just right. And they're anything but what Israel had become. Israel had become everything that this is. And in fact, he goes, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows are bent. They're ready. Just like Israel should have been ready for God. Israel should have been keeping God's law. Israel should have been prepared for the things that were coming at them when they started intermingling with all these weirdo nations and tribes and stuff, just like they did when Joshua came over. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was, it was Joshua, I think it was Joshua, um, might have been Judges, when, when they came and they started kind of spreading out and all of a sudden they couldn't, they couldn't defend themselves against the peoples that were in the area they went to, so instead of like moving or whatever, they just assimilated with them. And little by little, all their customs started getting intermingled with God's laws. And one by one, they kind of got watered down and watered down. And then the whole council culture kicked in. The council culture we're in right now ain't nothing new. 
That's been going on for thousands and thousands of years, and we're just in another wave of it right now. And Pepe Le Pew is just the most recent victim of all. Um, and I'll, I got to tell you what, man, I'm not a fan, Sam, I am, because I like Dr. Seuss. And my grandkids won't get to read Dr. Seuss now. Well, I mean, I'm sure we're going to black market the snot out of it. In fact, those six particular books that they banned, like, hit Amazon for, like, you know, 700, 800, 900 bucks, man. People were willing, and I'm like, oh, man. It's like uh, thinking back like on my Schwinn bike, man, a couple guitars I had, a couple cars that I had, a couple Hot Wheels I had. Oh, I remember one. I, uh, did anybody ever put baseball cards in their spokes? Yeah. Okay, I used to do that too um, until I got my big pipes and then you can't even hear them anymore. But <laughs> I had a box of cards that my grandpa gave me. True story, okay? A box of baseball cards. But they didn't work for what I wanted them to do. You know, it was a clothes pin and the card. Because they were really, like, small. They were, like, rectangle. They weren't, like, the big ones. They were, like, little skinny ones. And so I chucked them, and I bought a bunch of, you know, regular baseball cards. And this is probably in the 70s or something like that. Well, as it turns out, a later on investigation turned out that those little cards were some of the original baseball cards from way back when, had like Mickey Mantle on them and other important names like Babe Ruth. And my grandpa gave them to me because he collected them when he was younger. And it was like some heirloom thing. And I tossed them. And uh, yeah, and I'm still paying off my house right now. I'm paying <laughs> off a truck. And Anyway, so... They were ready to fight. They were good to go. Even their horses were ready. It says their horses' hooves will seem like flint, like stones, man. They're going to trample over them. They're going to be completely helpless, and their wheels like a whirlwind. They're bringing chariots to the party. They're, there's so much force coming at them. It says their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar. Now check this part out. And they lay hold of their prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. And you know what that means right there? That's about the captivity, about being grabbed, these helpless party animals all dressed to the nines, which remember we went through that. Their nines got 86 out of there. They're going to look like a bunch of worse than peasants. They have no fight in them. They have nothing against them to help them against the Assyrians or the Babylonians that are going to come and carry them away. Say, no one's going to put up a fight. And no one's going to come to deliver them from it either. Because who did they have? The one person that absolutely could have delivered them and prevented all this from happening. The one person. They turned their back on them and they rejected them. And now all of a sudden, you see where, where you start seeing allusions going up to like Revelation, the, the weeping and gnashing of the teeth? It makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Because now, oh, all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, God, where are you in, in our time of need? Well, he's been telling them all along here where he's at. But they were too busy living La Vida Loca to spend any time with God. And now that they want him, he ain't there. You know, the atheists of the world out there, oh, there ain't no God. I ain't believing no thing in God. And they get, as soon as they get in a car accident, what's the first thing they say before they hit? Oh, God. Right? <laughs> oh, I could go on with that one. But I won't. Amen? Because we love them too, and we want them to get saved as well. Well, look what happened. Go, go with me back. Wait, hold on. Let me show you something. This banner. Okay, yeah. Let me go this, back to that verse 25 for a second. And he will lift up a banner to the nations from afar. So we know that Assyria was the first one. Right? And uh, I can't remember exactly the order. It was the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom. One of the two. Judah and... Ah, north, apparently. The funny man says north, so we'll go with north right there. Who knew that he was such a comedian, right? Wow, somebody missed their calling. Well, you can still have that calling, Scotty, but anyway, um, the northern kingdom. And they get snatched up by the Assyrians, and like 100 years later, there was a, you know, Babel, Babylon, Babylon, or Nebuchadnezzar took on Assyria and kind of wiped them out. And then he absorbed the, the southern kingdom. And, and 
all these nations that were in there, that were, when you look at a map and you can like, and I, and I did, because when I show this thing in Acts, it's really a trip because all these, these nations that are listed in there were these guys right here. Were all these nations that we're reading about right here that jumped them? Well, because they were, you know, part of that whole Assyrian and Babylonian thing. And for that matter, the, uh, who are the other dudes? Uh, they turned out to be Iranians. Um, what was the other place? Uh, huh? Persia. That's the one. Persia right there. And they were also the same thing. You know, they were, they were a conglomeration of nations that had been captured. And so you kind of look at them only as Syrian, Babylonian, or Persian, or Greece, or something like that. But you have to look at it as the way warfare took place, that there was a lot of nations that were in, when you look at the, like the, the map of, of Assyria, you can see where it wraps around in like uh, Elam and Phrygia, these places that, were part of all this when they were, when, when God's people opposed him. Now look over here with that. Go back over to Acts again. We're going to go up a little bit further to around the ninth or so, I think it was. Where, where am I going? Acts 2. Let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Let's go with 8. So, so what happens here after this... Uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, now this is the this is the coming of the Holy Spirit, right? And they're gonna have this utterance of these languages they're gonna be able to speak, and all these people are like standing out there. And it says, And how is it that we we hear each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia? Now, if you look at a map of Mesopotamia, and even furthermore, you like Google a map of uh, of the uh, Assyrian the Assyrian nations conquered, you'll see all these names, Parthian, Medes, and Elamites, that were, that were part of that Assyrian captivity back in Isaiah. They were against God's people. And they were the part, they took part in the end of Judaism. That fire that we talked about, that tongue of fire, signaled the end of Judaism. And these people were involved in it. Check this out. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. So Asia was kind of like, uh, like Turkey, part of Turkey. All these nations, look, I, I listed them down here somewhere. Modern day Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Egypt were all part of that Assyrian. And also later on part of the Babylonian um, nation or whatever the heck you want to call it. All these places, all these people right here took part in this Isaiah madness back here and the captivities when God ended Judaism now what we have here in the book of Acts at the second coming the second appearance of tongues of fire is the beginning of Christianity now check this out all these nations were part of that ending well all these nations are part of the beginning Look at what it says here. Pompous, Asia, verse 10, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We could all hear them in our own tongues and the uh, blah, 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 own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Now, these people here are believers on God, but they're being introduced to Jesus Christ. Because as this went on, back in Isaiah, Countless numbers of people died. In fact, it even said, let me go back right quick here. I know I'm bouncing, but just hang in there with me. It even said back here in around 25, the carcasses were as refuge in the midst of the streets. There were bodies everywhere. Death. Now, coming back into 700 years later in the book of Acts, there was thousands of, of bodies here too but these are bodies that were saved when you continue reading on peter went on with his really cool uh um soliloquy his preaching when he became he went from peter the big scary fisherman to peter the preacher and something like three thousand, i think it was on this day decided to give their life to christ so these, this tongue of fire thing, even though the words are differently, are different in the Greek and, and Hebrew, 
it was still kind of like a bookend thing that was going on. But check it out. This, even this, wasn't the end. What this was is the beginning of Christianity. Judaism still wasn't back yet. They, they at, by this time, they had um, a sacrificial system and they had priests, but it was so corrupt that God wasn't recognizing what they was kind of like, kind of like what they were doing back here in Isaiah. Remember, they were doing sacrifices and uh, new moon convocations and and their assemblies and all this other stuff. And God, what God said about it then, as He's saying about it now here, it makes me sick. I I can't even bear it anymore. It, it's just so much like if somebody you know is like your buddy and they love you and stuff like that and they're really glad to see you, they hug you and stuff like that, and they walk out the door and they're like, man can't stand that person i just wish they would stub their stinking toe you know that's just mean anybody ever stub their toe in here that's nothing to wish upon anybody man or your knee on like a coffee table or something like that some of the stuff people wish on people is just unbelievable but anyway so he goes on to do this as as this is all beginning here keep in mind that even throughout all this stuff, there was still a bunch of tomfoolery going on with Judaism. Christianity was taken off, and Christianity has continued to go. Do you know that there's almost 8 billion people on the planet right now? That's a lot. There was like 6 billion a couple weeks ago, it seemed like. Almost 3 billion of that 8 are Christians in the world, which means there's still a whole lot of people that ain't Christians, right? Though there's still a ton, there's like a third of all the people on the planet are Christians, so two-thirds are not, right? Now, keep this little nugget in mind. Almost two billion are Muslim now. That religion has really taken off, too. We have a a ton of work to do, and not everybody, in fact, probably a lot, are not going to turn to Christ. And just like back here when those, because remember I was telling you, this, this section we just read here, at the end of chapter 5, happened for them, but it hasn't happened for us yet. It's still in our future, or our children's future, or our grandchildren's future, or our great-grandchildren's future, however that's going to be. But the same thing that we just read in Isaiah 5 is still going to come to pass down the road. There will be bodies everywhere, and there will be fire. There will be judgment. There will be tribulation. There will be a thousand-year millennial kingdom, all this is still going to happen. But the difference is, from this tongue of fire, it wasn't an end. It was a beginning. And we are part of that beginning right now. This whole tongues of fire that took place in Acts was the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We exist now in the time of the Holy Spirit. We have so much power, and I say that all the time around here, we have so much power in the Holy Spirit, but a lot of it, a lot of times we just aren't receiving it or allowing it to take off. So this first thing that we read was part one. That was part one of this whole judgment thing here. The, uh, the end of Israel is a nation, but a remnant was restored. And after a long time and some really bad stuff, remember in uh, what, what book was it? Um, the wall um, starts with an N. Nehemiah, that's right. And uh, Cyrus let Nehemiah come back and start building the walls of Jerusalem again. And, and there was a little bit of problems going on and stuff. Well, that remnant came back and built the wall. Things were doing good. They had a long period of time where everything was like super cool. People were following God's laws. And then little by little... People started coming in and taking this and taking that and taking this and taking that. You should be highly concerned about cancel culture because it's an infection and it's like a cancer that spreads and little by little. And I think we've lost a lot over the last 30, 40 years anyway, but there's something about the last five, four, five, six years. I mean, some of the Pepe Le Pew. Really? Because he kissed a cat without permission or something like that? Listen, <clears throat> it's a cartoon. It's a stinking cartoon. Okay? Anyway. Uh, I don't think that would have helped, but 
Um, although might might have stopped a few of those knuckleheads from being born. What did you say? Never mind. That's, we'll talk about it afterwards. Not important. So the, the well, it is actually important, but. Part two was the destruction and the, and the dispersion in 70 AD. So after, after Jerusalem, Israel came back and Jerusalem was coming and the corruption came in and all the junk went on and then they started, you know, opposing Rome. Because remember, Israel had never been its own nation. Even up, to, even up to the time of Jesus, because they were there, they were doing sacrifice. They were doing that because they were allowed to by Rome. And Rome's own little dictator that they would pop in there, like Herod and stuff like that, you know, that would, you know, kind of pretend to be a Jewish leader, but everybody knows that he wasn't. He wasn't even Jewish, actually. And they finally rebelled over some stuff that jumped off with some money that got taken and got used for a water system. It was really a goofy thing. Anyway, and when they sent Titus in there, they pretty much just surrounded Jerusalem and starved everybody, and it was a pretty brutal thing. And you can read about that in the, um, what is that, uh, Josephus, it's called, and thank you, Scotty. I, I was like right there. It was almost coming out of my mouth, but thank you, Scotty. Antiquities, that's right. It is brutal reading. I'll tell you right now, before you read it, be prepared for some really gory details of what happened within the walls of Jerusalem during that time in 71 AD. Anyway, even after all that, there was still a remnant because there was a dispersion. They, people just scattered all over the world. And I know that during World War II, there was a big push to try to wipe them off the face of the earth. And a lot of them certainly did perish in all that. But here they are gathering again. And I got to tell you, man, after three times, well, two times, don't you think they would have learned? I mean, you know, if you, I, I hit, I hit my finger. Well, I, sorry, I cut them off first. And then I had the, the little pin sticking out and I went back to work framing out in the desert. And I, and so this finger was just had a big, long pin sticking out. So I couldn't really use, so I used this finger that that didn't have a pen, and my thumb had a pen, so I kind of got the nail in the right place. Boom! And I smacked my finger with a brand new Vaughn 28-ounce framing oh. hammer. And for those of you that aren't aware of what that is, it's an implement of torture. <laughs> and it has a hammerhead with a bunch of little points on it, like pointy points. And until it gets kind of flattened down a little bit, if you hit any part of your body with it, it's like an insta-shred. And so I hit this finger, and exploded it all over the two by four and all that stuff. And I kind of shook it off and I got some duct tape and wrapped up the parts and put them back in and stuff. My boss told me, come on, we gotta get this done. I'm like, ugh. And so I grabbed another 16 penny and held it with this one and gave it everything I had and I hit that finger right there. Not so much here or here, but right there. And the reason that's important is because right there was six little screws holding this finger on right here. And so that little bump that's over here, that's one of those six screws that I knocked out of the bone with that stinking hammer. And it's still knocked out to this day. So I can truly go around and say that I have a screw loose. Because I do. Anyway. The point behind it was, it happened to me twice, and then that hammer turned into a UFO out there in the desert. And it just, somewhere far, far out into the desert, landed in a coyote. I'm sorry. I didn't take a third swing, is what I'm trying to tell you here. All right. These guys have had one swing, two swings, and guess what they're coming up on right now? Number three. And they still haven't got it yet, even after all this information, all the prophecy, and not only prophecy, like, yeah, that might happen, because Crusher, you know, said he saw a vision, blah, blah, blah. This stuff happened. It's historical. It's in the books. It wasn't like conjecture. It really, really happened. Jesus really, really happened. His crucifixion really, really happened. His resurrection really, really happened, too. So with all that really, 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 doesn't it stand to reason that when you get to the end of the book down here, 
that all this is really, really going to happen, dude? Wouldn't it seem dumb like weird that God would have this much of the book really happen, but then this much over here is a fairy tale? Yet, they still haven't got it. So the third one's coming. You're gonna, they're going to see it happen, just so you know. They're going to see it happen when all of these Christians disappear off the face of the earth. When that rapture happens. And even then, the Bible tells us, there's going to be people that still will reject God. Even after that happens, they'll make up some stupid excuse like, you know, we all got on a spaceship and went to Venus or something like that. You know, some goofy thing or we're all living in a commune in the desert like all 2.8 billion of us are living in a compound in Landers. I don't know. Anything to reject God. And then... This really cool dude's going to come along and go, you know what, I can fix all the problems of the world, man. In fact, all these little fans you got blown in the desert, useless. Get rid of them, man. Somebody dig me up a dinosaur, all right, because I'm putting that in my gas tank, and I'm going to drive my car on gasoline. Do we have green people in here? I'm sorry if I've offended, because I probably have, but that's okay. I'm not a big proponent on global warming. In fact, when I left my house, the last thing that was on my mind was global stinking warming, okay? <laughs> because it's freaking freezing out there right now. And if it's supposed to be getting warmer, I should have been warm. Hello, I rest my case. Done. Anyway, this judgment's going to come upon them. This tribulation, this dude's going to come, and he's going to be like this super cool dude. And then all of a sudden, about halfway through all this, he's going to change the stinking rules. And you think this is a cancel culture? Wait till you see what this guy pulls on these people. And then all hell's going to break loose. There's going to be like this big rebellion. And this dude's going to call all his armies. And he's going to go, hey, you. And he's going to whistle. And he's going to come over here. And they're going to come in there, man, and kill people. It's going to be like wholesale death. All right? And they're going to surround Jerusalem. And they're going to be like, you know, this is it. One flail swoop and we're dead. And then God's going to pop in the picture like, oh, you want to get into this too? And he's going to go, and like blow, and they're all just going to like be ash floating up. Remember how that said over there? What did it say back here? I love the way he put it over here. It said, the fire is going to consume like chaff. Their root will be as rottenness, and their bosom will, their blossom will ascend like dust. Poof. P-O-O-F. Poof. That's, that's actually Hebrew, but... Nice try there. Yeah. Anyway, and that will truly be the end. And all of this stuff that we just talked about in five, the interesting thing for me is that it's, we can see it in all three places. We can see it historically for Israel. We can see it in a future tense for us or whoever God chooses to be that generation. I personally hope we're the generation of rapture. I, I want to be like, Especially like riding my boat, especially like on a cold night like this, where it's going to rain and I'm like, this sucks, man, what a dragon. And I'm out of here. I'd be like, thank you, Lord, I am your favorite. Wow. Um, but if not, as a parent and a grandparent and eventually a potential great grandparent, I do want to try to do the best I can for my kids and my kids' kids, and your kids, and your kids' kids. Because sometimes we get hung up on ourselves. That's what was going on with Israel back here. They're all hung up on their, their stuff right now, the here and now. They weren't thinking about the future of their families. Because people can get pretty like narrow-minded and you know tunnel-visioned on that stuff. But we know, and as Christians, we know what's coming. And because of the fact that we know, we have an obligation to share what we know with a lost and broken world out there. Far be it from us to keep this information to ourselves, right? It's kind of like a big hole in the ground in the dark, and you know it's there, but you're just going to let Crusher just walk right into it without saying anything. Would that be mean? Absolutely. Would, would you tell Crusher? How many of you would tell Crusher there's a hole? Oh, my goodness, like half, dude. <laughs> wow. I'd tell you just before <laughs> but i tell you you know what the difference in all this is though there's one fundamental difference in all this that i've talked about tonight jesus christ that's the one fundamental difference 
And as we go through Isaiah, we're going to learn more and more about Jesus. Maybe stuff you didn't even know as, as he describes the Savior in a language from 700 years prior about a man that didn't even exist yet. And that was all because God told him to you. So here's the get it tonight. Isn't it interesting how the events in the Bible are similar? You know what? I, I skipped one. I got to share one more verse with you because this is the this is the absolute end here. It's in fact it's literally the end of Isaiah, but it's so cool because it talks about flame. Anyway, it's over. It's back. It's in sixty six verse fifteen. I don't know if I oh I did okay. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. You remember what we were talking about there in five? How their chariot wheels are going to be crazy. Their weapons are going to be like powerful. And the flames will burn. This at the end of Isaiah tells us whose they are. Because you can, you can ascribe them to Syria or Assyria or Babylon or Persia. But make no mistake, God's the one that called those banners in. And he's the one that whistled from afar. Be careful how we approach God. We might be looking at him like, well, all we got to do is worry about God. He's long suffering. He's not going to do anything, and blah, blah. And then something comes in from the side over here and gets you with a haymaker. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Boom. And clocks you like, whoa, where'd that come from? Surely God wouldn't allow that to happen to me. Don't be surprised what God will use to get your attention if you're just really being obstinate. Does that knowledge change your view on evangelism? All this that we talked about right now, knowing that prophecy has been fulfilled, prophecy will be fulfilled, and we're part of prophecy. We are involved in all this stuff. We may not be named, but we know that because we've made a decision to follow Christ, we are involved in all this stuff so what is our responsibility within this stuff it's really pretty simple jesus is the one that told us look i send you out as lambs among wolves jesus sends us out he nanny that's what this is all about if you claim to be a christian if you've called on the name of jesus you now are part of that group that needs to go out right now whether we are or aren't that's all, that's up to individuals here but as a church we're certainly We've tried, we've, we've made efforts to get out there. And once we're through this uh, plague here, we'll be right back out there again, amen? And so here's the application. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it goes on to say, you know, like, I can't remember what it says, like a fool. Let's see if I have it marked here somewhere. I might have it marked. A fool said something goofy. What was it? Proverbs 117. Hold on, I'll tell you what it says. It said, it said, the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, but a fool despises wisdom and instruction. And that's absolutely true. All these people that we've talked about, they're fools. They're all fools. They're dead fools. The people that are coming are still live fools, but there's still hope. As long as they have air in their lungs, there's hope for them, right? But in the end, they're either going to choose Christ or they're going to be fools. And they're going to face what comes and what judgment happens. And there's nothing you can do about it beyond us sharing our faith. Amen. It's always up to them. But the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. This is how we get knowledge right here. And not about being, oh, you know, trembling. The fear is a reverent fear that what he said back here is true. What he said right here is happened. And what he said up here is going to happen. And if you don't have a great fear and respect for God based on everything in the word of God, then you're probably a fool. Sorry if I offended. I can be less than politically correct. And just so you know, I like Pepe Le Pew. So... Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. There's a lot there, Father. But Lord, thank you for helping us to break it down a little bit, hopefully, Lord, and that we can see how so much happens in your word, Father, that corresponds with each other, Lord, that it's not just a, a book, Lord. It's a living, breathing thing, Lord. And we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's active and alive. And Father, tonight... As we've gone through this and we've, we've looked at stuff that's coming, stuff that's been, that maybe tonight, Father, hearts have been changed in here, Father. Maybe hearts are changed out there. 
whatever it is, Lord, we're going to pray together as a family. And if your Holy Spirit's tugging on someone's heart, then I pray tonight that they receive that. And tonight they come to you, maybe come back to you, whatever that is, Lord. But as we pray, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to have his way in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all pray. Father God, I've sinned against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that was a lot, right? I mean, there was a lot of bouncing going on there. But when you go home, you take a notes and stuff like that. Dig into it yourself. And I encourage you guys, figure out something to search out in the Bible as the law of first mention. You will truly be amazed at the stuff you can find in the Word of God. And I mean, it's like kind of addictive, actually. And I, I would encourage you guys to take a day, maybe, like a Sunday or something where you're not really got anything going on, and just spend some time in here for the fun of it and just see where God leads you. Amen. Till then, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.